So continuing on with the uh, discussion about pre-processing, here things are going to get even more, um, uh, I don't know, subjective, I guess. So now I'm going to talk specifically about trial rejection. And um, I always do manual trial rejection. That means I look at all the trials from uh, all the conditions, all the subjects, um, many, many thousands of trials. I look everything by eye. I look at everything uh, by eye and manually mark trials for rejection. This is a little bit of a debated topic in the literature, whether you should do manual trial rejection or automatic trial rejection. And I understand um, <clears throat> and sympathize with the motivations for our, um, automatic uh, trial rejection. Um, and there the idea is, you know, the uh, procedures for rejecting a trial should be clear. Uh, they should be reproducible. And it would be nice if, you know, anyone who was pre-processing the same data would get exactly the same results. They would uh, reject exactly the same trials. Um, but in my experience, uh, I, I, I have never been satisfied with any, uh, any algorithm or set of algorithms for doing manual trial rejection. I find that they always produce type 1 and type 2 errors. That is to say that um, every time I've tried some algorithm for, uh, for rejecting uh, data, it has rejected data that I would not think should be rejected. And it has also failed to reject data that I think should be rejected. So I, I, I think that manual trial rejection is really uh, the least bad option here. It is admittedly a little bit, uh, or there is some, uh, sometimes some subjectivity uh, that's involved. And so um, I think the important thing is that uh, one person should be um, uh, rejecting all of the uh, uh, data from all the subjects. That way there's no um, uh, differential bias being introduced by different uh, experimenters, different users. Um, and uh, also that you should be blind to the experimental conditions. So you shouldn't think, well, I'd like to reject this trial, but it's in this condition that I like, so maybe I won't reject it. Yeah, I mean, your uh, criteria for rejecting trials, if that, that is a little bit subjective, then it should at least be um, uh, uh, blind to uh, the different experimental conditions. So what I'm going to do in the rest of this, and I, I should say, by the way, people disagree with me about this. There are plenty of people out there who um, disagree that uh, data should be manually cleaned and they should be automatically uh, algorithm-based uh, cleaned. And so I, I, I think it's a difficult issue and I think everyone needs to, you know, come to their own decision about how they think is best to clean their own data. Um, this is my decision. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just show you a few different examples of um, trials that I have and have not rejected. Um, just to kind of walk you through my, my reasoning, my light, what goes through my head when I'm looking at uh, these different trials. Um, this is all in EEG lab, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you don't necessarily have to use uh, EEG lab for this. Okay, first of all, well, the most prominent thing that looks like artifacts is all these external channels. In fact, these are non-re-referenced external channels. These are um, like the uh, eye movement uh, uh, EOG channels, and I think there might also be some um, uh, uh, um, EMG on the fingers which are also not locally re-referenced. So you would just ignore these channels. In fact, generally I would recommend uh, excluding these uh, or re-referencing these channels before getting uh, too distracted by them. But So here we see some little artifacts. These are small, uh, brief bursts of high-frequency muscle artifact. Um, in this case, I think these are probably safe to leave in. Uh, because they're small, they're brief, you can never entirely get rid of all of these artifacts from your data. And in this particular experiment, uh, I was focusing on relatively lower frequency activity, so really just frequencies up to, you know, around uh, alpha, like um, 15 hertz or, or and below. And so in this particular case, you have a high frequency artifact. It's brief, it's small, it only affects some anterior lateral channels. So I actually would just leave these in. I'll show you examples later of situations where 
similar artifacts are a little bit more widespread, but similar kinds of artifacts would lead me to reject a trial. Okay, um, here you see lots of uh, blinks. Each one of these big bumps in the data uh, is uh, from a blink, um, but I don't reject trials based on blinks, uh, except for some cases, uh, which I'll explain later. Um, or I guess I can explain it now, just that you don't stay in suspense for the next few minutes. Blinks are a, a difficult um, uh, issue in, uh, in cognitive VEG. So blinks produce these very large artifacts, as you can see here in the data. Um, there, there's two issues. If you just, uh, if you don't remove blinks, then they will uh, negatively impact their sources of artifacts. You can see visually, it's very clear that the blinks are orders of magnitude bigger than the actual EEG data. So they, they present uh, very big artifacts. On the other hand, if you specifically instruct your subjects not to blink and you tell them that it's really bad to blink and blink trials with blinks have to be removed and so on, this is kind of the, the old school ERP strategy. The problem with this is two things. One, subjects can be so distracted by inhibiting their blinking that they're paying less attention to the task, so they might not be doing the task as well because they're so preoccupied by blinking. And second, uh, these uh, networks, so blinking is of course a very uh, automatic and necessary process. Of course you can inhibit your blinking, but it takes quite some cortical processing power. And so, you know, we have these kind of frontal and frontoparietal networks that we need to help us inhibit our blinks. And these might be, um, you know, if, if, the, if subjects sort of want to blink at certain times of the task, but they know they're not supposed to, then inhibiting their blinking is actually a source of like neurocognitive artifact because you'll see these kind of blink suppression or you won't see them you, because you don't know exactly when they're happening but there are these uh, blink suppression mechanisms that are uh, getting into the data. Anyway, um, ICA is generally very successful at removing uh, blinks in most cases. Um, I think possibly the next lecture that will be just about um, uh, independent components analysis for data cleaning. So all that said, uh, there is um, uh, one s definite specific case where you should remove trials that have blinks, even if the blink artifacts themselves can be removed. And that is if the blink happens exactly at stim onset, at the stimulus onset, and if the stimulus is very brief. So in that case, you know, a poorly timed blink might mean that the subject just actually didn't see the trial uh, and so if there are if you have very fast uh, very quickly presented stimuli and the blink happens to be right at, around the time of the stimulus then i would remove that uh, trial anyway even though ica could get rid of the artifact okay so that's all about uh, blinks here you see lots of uh, of uh, high frequency noise it really cuts across all the channels um, and you can also see, so this is the stimulus marker here. It's kind of right in the pre-stimulus baseline period. So this is, this is bad. We definitely want to remove this trial because we don't want our baseline uh, to contain all of this uh, artifactual activity. Now here is another interesting counterexample. You can see the artifact is, is quite similar to this one. Uh, but it, it, it ends earlier, and in particular, it ends during this uh, buffer period. And this is not this artifact does not contaminate the time period that we that I'm going to use for the baseline normalization in time frequency analyses. Um, so in this case, I think it's actually okay to uh, leave this trial in. Although I I clicked it and it turned yellow, but um, I, I think this trial would be safe to leave in the data. Uh, because the artifact is not going to um, uh, influence the, the period of time that you are um, focusing on in your analyses. Okay, here we get to another interesting situation with, uh, so this is not really a blink, this is uh, the person just had their eyes closed, that's what you see here. Um, you can tell the difference, yeah, the, the blink would be much more transient. So. Uh, ICA can actually remove this artifact um, 
And if you if you run IC identify the the eye movement related component, you could see that this all this activity would come back up and it would look like a normal trial. So we would be able to remove the artifact from the data on this trial. However, when you look at this trial and you think about what was happening, the subject didn't just blink, the subject closed their eyes for, you know, maybe a second or two seconds. And so probably the subject was a little bit tired or distracted or falling asleep, you know, a little like micro sleep uh, moment there. So I would remove this trial anyway, not because of this artifact per se, but because I don't believe that the subject was really fully engaged in the task on this trial. So I would remove this one, even though um, an automatic uh, uh, trial rejection procedure might not remove it. And even though ICA can probably um, uh, remove this artifact from the data. Okay, here we have two other examples. Um, here you see, yeah, there's, there's lots of stuff going on with the blinking. The subject is, is blinking a lot and moving their eyes around a lot. So I don't really, I'm a bit concerned that the subject was not really um, engaged in the task on this trial, so I would uh, remove this trial. Here you see a situation where the uh, the blink happened exactly in the pre-stimulus uh, baseline period, right at the uh, right before stim onset. Actually, this is a difficult one. I don't remember whether I uh, rejected this trial, but you also um, see this transient artifact on on this channel. So I think actually I probably would remove this trial because of the confluence of uh, of these um, poorly timed blinks and uh, our blink and and this little artifact here. Okay, let's see. So there's a couple things going on in this plot. One is that uh, this channel, I guess this is F7, it has a kind of weird time course. Um, and there clearly is some kind of low frequency characteristic uh, that is uh, that is producing an artifact on this trial. So these trial, these kinds of channels are, it's difficult to know what to do with them. And when I see something like this, the first thing I would look for is to see if there appears to be real EEG data on top of a slower artifact, or if there doesn't appear to be any real brain data that's actually measured on this. If I don't think that there's uh, any real EEG activity on this channel, then I just remove the channel altogether and interpolate it later. Um, if the uh, so, but in this case, it does seem to be, uh, there does seem to be real EEG data plus this big artifact. So we don't want this artifact. So then the question is, what can we do about it? Um, if this kind of artifact is, is continuous throughout the entire experiment, if you see every trial is doing this stuff, um, then it's likely that uh, ICA will be able to isolate that one uh, kind of lower frequency characteristic movement um, and uh, and then you will be able to uh, remove that component from the data and uh, recover a normal looking channel. That's what I hope in situations like this. That's not always possible. And when it's not possible, yeah, if it's a few trials, let's say it was only these few trials, then I would probably just reject these trials. Um, not only because of this artifact, but because if you have some weird artifact that only affects a few trials in a row, it might be that the subject was, maybe there, maybe there was something uncomfortable under that electrode and the subject was uh, just scratching that electrode or something. Yeah, weird things can happen. Um, sorry about the uh, siren outside. Um, so uh, at the worst case of if ICA is not really able to um, isolate a component that really just accounts for this artifact, then this is bad enough if it continues throughout the entire experiment, I would probably just uh, remove this channel and interpolate it. Okay, so that's about that. Um, here we have uh, a bigger EMG burst, and this happens during a time period in which we are interested, and it affects um, yeah, quite a few sort of frontal, uh, parietal, and lateral electrodes. So I think this one I would, uh, I would remove. Again, also not only for reasons of the data, but also because the subject was doing something here at this time that was uh, that produced this artifact, and the subject may not have been totally paying attention on that trial. 
Um, here we have another situation where, similar to what I mentioned earlier, um, this artifact appears during the period that I want to use for baseline uh, normalization. And so uh, this is going to get into the baseline, uh, the sort of um, broad band, higher frequency um, artifact is going to be in the baseline, which I don't want. We want the baseline to be nice and pure. So I think I would reject this trial as well. Okay, here we have a trial where there's another um, a strange burst of high frequency activity that affects all of the channels. Um, and all the channels seems like to roughly the same magnitude. So I don't know if this was, um, uh, this was, this may have been some mechanical problem or maybe uh, the, the wires uh, were, were moved or something. So something weird happened. And this also happens to be in the baseline period. So we really don't want this kind of artifact to be um, into the or leaking in contaminating the, the estimate of the baseline activity. So I think I would also reject this trial based on this um, pre stimulus uh, weirdness. All right, uh, here we have um, uh, a repeating artifact. This could be, uh, let's see, it's too fast to be a heart rate. Um, so this could be a mechanical thing. It could be a biological thing. Um, it's only on one channel and it appears throughout the entire experiment. Um, and so in this case, ICA should be pretty good at um, isolating this uh, artifact and uh, and removing it. Okay, that was it. It it um, it takes a lot of experience to to really become comfortable with manual trial rejection. It is admittedly a bit of an art. There is a subjective component to it. Um, again, it, in my opinion, uh, it's it's better, still better than uh, doing a blind uh, uh, trial rejection where you don't even look at the data and you don't even know what's getting accepted and what's getting rejected. So, but this is something yeah, you will have to um, have some practice and some, some sort of gut instinct about. And if you're ever um, confused or you don't know if there's, if, if you're looking at a trial, you don't know if you should remove it or not, then don't hesitate to ask other people around you who have more experience with the EG data analyses to uh, give you their advice.